morning I'm starting a brand new sermon series entitled Christmas Playlist. If you know your New Testament, there are four songs recorded in the Gospels. Four songs that center around the Savior's birth. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to look at each one of these songs in a playlist for Christmas. Today we come to Luke chapter 1 and we'll look at Mary's song. A subtitle could be Faith in Action. Mary's song shows us faith in action. So in the Gospels, we see four songs. The first we see is Mary's song, Luke chapter 1, verse 46 to 55. The second is Zechariah's song in Luke chapter 1, verse 67 to 69. The third is the angels' song as they rejoice, Luke chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. And then Simeon's song in Luke chapter 2, verses 28 to 35. So we've purchased the album, and each Sunday we're going to study one of the songs in this four-song set album as we look at the birth of the Savior. Today from Luke chapter 1, verse 46 to 55, we're talking about Mary's song as we see faith in action. You found it in your Bibles, Luke chapter 1, verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he's looked on the humblest state of his servant. For behold, now, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He's filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers and to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Remember this morning the power is in the word of God. God, thank you for your word today. I pray that you would speak to us. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would empower this message, empower your word, empower our minds and our hearts as we listen to your word. Speak to us in Jesus' name, amen. If you're a country music fan, you have heard the name Travis Tritt. If you've never heard of Travis Tritt, he's got several famous songs. He's actually a Georgia boy, grew up not too far from here. Travis Tritt grew up in country music singing in the bars and the back alley honky-tonks before he made it big. He said he sung for a rough crowd. Now, I know what you may be thinking. What in the world does Travis Tritt have to do with Mary and Christmas? I promise there's a connection. Travis Tritt said that occasionally as he was singing in the back alley bars and the honky-tonks, a fight would break out between the bikers and the rednecks. And if a fight would break out between the bikers and the rednecks, the bikers would run, grab the pool sticks, and the rednecks would run out to the cars looking for the gun rack. And he didn't know what to do because everything was starting to fall apart. And one night when the fight seemed to be reaching its peak, you know what Travis Tritt did? He took his little guitar and he started to sing the song Silent Night. In the middle of July, in a bar or a honky-tonk. But all of a sudden... All of the anger and all of the fighting and all of the fussing and everything seemed to to, to just instantly dissipate. And all these bikers and all these rednecks and all these rough dudes just began to listen. And he said he'd sit there sweating to death, singing songs about Christmas. And every one of them would pay attention and listen. Some of the bikers even cried. Now here we have Mary's song. In Luke chapter 1, as the angel appears to Mary, as God tells Mary, you're going to be the one to carry the Christ child, the Messiah. A virgin will conceive and give birth. Here's Mary's song in response to that news, in response to what she heard. This is how she replies. Now, many have said that this is one of the most powerful songs in the entire Bible. E. Stanley Jones, a famous Methodist preacher and scholar, said that this Christmas carol is the most revolutionary document in the history of the world. 
One modern writer said that when you read the lyrics of Mary's song, of her Christmas song, you sniff the powder of dynamite. That there is power and might and strength in this song. Mary's song contains quotations from several different references in the Old Testament. Specifically, she refers to Hannah, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. She had hidden the word of God in her heart, and now as she exclaims in joy the reality that she's experiencing, she proclaims the goodness and the grace of God. Now, many of you may know this song is called the Magnificat. It's because the very first word of this passage in Latin is Magnificat. That's about all the Latin I know. In the margin of my Bible, it actually says the Magnificat, meaning as she begins her song, she says, magnify, I magnify and glorify the Lord. She uses the phrase eight times in this passage, she uses the phrase, he has, he has, talking about the goodness and the grace of God. This song, think about it now, this song written by an unmarried teenage peasant girl who finds herself pregnant, a girl named Mary. Now most unwed, young, poor mothers don't burst out in song rejoicing. But this is a song of joy and gratitude. Mary knew that this was no ordinary child. Let's dive in as we look at Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 46. First of all, I want you to notice God's undeserved grace. God's undeserved grace. Grace. Mary begins her song, the first verse or the first stanza, by recounting the amazing, undeserved, unmerited favor of God by talking about the grace of God. Notice how she begins, my soul magnifies the Lord. I want you to notice something important. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Now I want you to circle those words in verse 47. God my Savior. There are some who believe that Mary never needed salvation. There are some who believe that Mary was also born miraculously of an immaculate conception and that Mary had no sin. There are some who believe that Mary is co-redemptress. In other words, that she, along with Jesus Christ, purchased our salvation and redemption. So they worship Mary, they venerate Mary, and they pray to Mary. But I want you to notice how Mary prays. What does Mary say? My soul rejoices in God. What are those words? My Savior. Only sinners need a Savior. And so what we learn is that Mary recognized this child that she was bearing, the Messiah, would not just save others from their sin, but she would be saved from her sin as well. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My heart rejoices in God, my Savior. Why? Verse 48, he's looked on the humble estate of his servant. Literally, Mary sees her littleness. Both in the world's eyes and even from God's perspective. Mary looks and says, me? You mean that that I'm the one that you've chosen to carry this, this Christ child? I'm the one to bring the Messiah into this world. Her words tell us that Mary feels totally unworthy. And that is absolutely required qualification to be used by God. I don't deserve this. I'm so small and insignificant. Nobody knows who I am. Nobody recognizes my name. Nobody would believe me that I'm a virgin. Nobody would believe this. Here you get the sense that she feels unworthy. Just a Another poor girl among thousands who who lived their lives in the backwater town of of a captive nation. But here, Mary rejoices in the grace of God. I think she's struck by by how God's choice and the world's choice seem so unlikely, seem seem so incongruent. How, How different God's choice is from what man would choose. We would want the most popular. We would want the beauty queen. We would want the celebrity. We would want the most well-known. I've discovered that there's always a question. 
one single question that arises in the heart of anyone that God wants to use. And that question is typically, why me? If God wants to use you, if God wants to use me, one of our first responses is not, well, God, it's about time. Our first response, typically, if we're in the right place, is, God, I don't understand why you would want to use someone like me. I don't deserve this. I know my own sin. I know my own fallibility. I know my own imperfections. How is it that you would choose somebody like me? And Mary felt that question. Listen, this humility, this lowliness, this brokenness, these are part of the abiding marks of somebody that God wants to use. Humility is required. There's a, there's a mark on a person who spent long enough time in the presence of God that they come to understand how good, how great, and how gracious God is, but also how low and undeserving we are. Notice what she says in verse 50. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Here she sings that the mercy of God goes on forever. That his gracious love extends to every generation. And so basically what she's saying is what everyone who knows Jesus says. God, you didn't give me what I deserve. You didn't give me what I earned on my own. You gave me grace. You showed me mercy from generation to generation. That's undeserved grace. To, to say that grace is undeserved is almost redundant, isn't it? Because grace, by its very nature, in its very definition, grace is God giving us good things we don't deserve. God has given each and every one of us the fact that we have breath in our lungs, that your heart is beating in this moment, that you are alive, that you're under the sound of my voice, that you're here worshiping God, that we just celebrated Thanksgiving. All of us have experienced the undeserved grace of God. And here Mary just highlights it for us. Her song just proclaims how great and gracious. In the first stanza, we see something wonderful and true about God, that God loves those who are undeserving, God loves those who are unqualified, God loves those who are unimpressive. Because when he chooses someone like Mary, the people you would least likely expect, everyone knows this must be God. Can't be Mary. What's special about her? It's God. This is his undeserved grace. Mary stands before the Lord just like we do, needy, flawed, with nothing to merit his favor, nothing to earn his salvation, only deserving of judgment. But she's amazed that God, not only does he know her name, he knows her so well that he chooses her anyway. And here's a gift you won't find under the tree this season. It's the gift of God's grace offered freely to all who willingly accept and receive it. First, we see God's undeserved grace. Secondly, in verses 51 to 53, we see God's unbelievable power. God's unbelievable power. In these next few verses, as she kind of sings her second stanza, second verse to her song, Mary magnifies God's power, His might, and His strength. In this stanza, she sings of radical reversals from what our world values. What does the world value? Wealth, power, fame, prestige, popularity. These are all things that our world says are important. All of the things that our world values. And now here she rejoices in God and it seems to be a, a reversal of everything else that the world says is important or significant. Here, as she sings, she shows, shows us three things that God will do for those who humbly receive him. Three things that God's great power can do for you. Right, right, right here in, in verse 51, we see that he will rescue the helpless. Here, Mary begins to sing. As she's singing, she's rejoicing. And she says, he's shown the strength with his arm. He scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. And so God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so he will rescue the humble. He will rescue the helpless. 
Interesting. He's shown the strength with his arm. Those of us that know we can't do this on our own. Those of us who recognize that we desperately need the Lord. Those of us who understand that we don't have any strength and ability. That he will rescue the helpless. I love this phrase. He's shown strength with his arm. That's an interesting phrase. When the boys were little, one of the things that we liked to do, the boys would always like to arm wrestle me. When they were little, and so, you know, they normally, I'd put my arm up there and then have to lay a couple of books on the table just to get their arm at the same length as mine. And then I'd pretend to have a hard time with it for a little while. And then they'd put both hands on there and they'd pull with all of their might, with all of their weight, and I'd pretend like they were winning, you know. But then something in me kicked in and I said, I'm not letting them beat me. These boys are going to learn they have to earn it. And so right before they thought they were going to win, I could pick all of them up with all their entire body, if necessary, and pin them in the arm wrestling contest. Do you know, do you know that it seems to me the world tries to arm wrestle with God that same way? Oh, we're big and we're bad and we're important. All these overpaid athletes or all these prideful politicians or all these overhyped celebrities think they can arm wrestle with God. And God puts up with it for a little while. Have you, know, have you noticed that? Like there's, there's a part of us sometimes, as God, when are you going to just put this thing to rest and say, watch this, with the strength of your arm, finish everything. He puts up with it for a little while because he's gracious and he's loving. But there'll come a day, there will be a time, Mary says, with the strength of his arm, he'll scatter the proud, that there will be a day when God will right every wrong, when God will make everything new, when God will set everything straight. Listen, if, if you're caught up in the world's values, if you're fresh out of options this morning, if you feel like you've been dealt a crummy hand in life, if... If you don't know which way to turn, that I've got a message for you. Bring your case to God. If you feel helpless, he's the helper. He's a God that will rescue and redeem you. But if you're proud and mighty, the Bible says that he will bring you low. So don't, don't fawn over all these actors and all these famous people. Don't, don't search after wealth as your goal. Don't despair over which party has the most seats in Congress. Listen, all of this stuff can make us worry if we didn't know and trust and believe that God is in control and that he will set everything right with the strength of his arm. Let the song of Mary comfort you. God just lets the powerful strengthen their position for a little while. And then one day he will exert enough influence where, as the Bible says in Amos chapter 5, justice will flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. He rescues the helpless. Secondly, he'll restore the humble. Here, Mary says in verse 52, he's brought down the mighty from the thrones and he exalts those of humble estate. So the mighty, the powerful, I mean, she's speaking about her, her personal experience. Mary thinks, I could have given you a list of all the other people that God could have chosen for this task, but all of those mighty ones, he didn't choose, he chose me. All the mighty have fallen, and here she, she says he exalts those of humble estate. I want you to maybe, outside of verse 52, here's a great example. Right in the margin of your Bible, Nebuchadnezzar. And you'd say, Pastor, how do I spell that? <laughs> you can just put N-E-B if you want. Or I could spell it for you. N-E-B-U-C-H-A-D-N-E-Z-Z-A-R. Yes, I did look at my notes just to make sure I had it right. No, I'm not going to spell it again. You can look it up. Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4 recounts how the mighty fall. How Nebuchadnezzar lifted up his eyes and he said, look at all that my hands have done. And God said, watch what I can do with one fell swoop. I can humble you. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 37. After this, Nebuchadnezzar says, I praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all of his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Nebuchadnezzar knew it now, didn't he? 
What does the Bible tell us in Luke chapter 14 and verse 11? God exalts the proud. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. God exalts the humble, but he pushes the proud away. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. How many times has God deposed the Herods and the Hitlers and the Husseins of this world? How many times has God said, you think you're powerful, watch. With the strength of his arm, he restores the humble. Maybe, maybe Mary's song reminds us that we need to reverse our ambitions. If we want to succeed in God's economy, we need to learn humility, not pride. We need to seek after service, not strength or power. We need to bow to his authority, not rise up and claim our own independence. God's looking for humble people. Third, the Bible tells us here he will reward the hungry. Here, Mary says, he's filled up the hungry with good things, and the rich he sent away empty. Those who are hungry who come to God are filled, but those who are rich and prideful, he sends them away. I think of your Mary and the rich young ruler. The one who thinks he has everything walks away sorrowful. But the one who believes she has nothing now stands to gain everything. That's the way it is in God's economy. You don't come to the foot of the cross in pride and arrogance with nose held high and shoulders bent back. You come kneeling, begging for mercy, and you find there's mercy there to meet your need. This is a God who rewards those who are hungry. God's looking for people who are hungry for him, not those who are self-sufficient. If you're full of yourself, you're not hungry for God. God's looking for people who are hungry for him. What does the Bible say? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why? They will be filled. You can't let God fill you up if you're full of yourself. The church, the kingdom, Jesus is looking for people who feel their own emptiness. This is the kind of folks that God is looking for. God loves those who feel like they've been forgotten, that feel like they've been passed over, that, that, that feel like they've got nothing to give. God says, watch what I can do with somebody like you. He pledges himself to those that, that know they're broken. He shows mercy to those who don't deserve it. He chooses the lowly over the proud. He finds the hungry and he fills them. God is on the side of those who think they can't handle it on their own. They're the ones who actually know the real story. I want you to know this finally. God's unstoppable promise. God's undeserved grace. God's unbelievable power. God's unstoppable promise. Not only do we see his undeserved grace... His unbelievable power. But look at his promise in verse 54 and 55. Mary sings not just about herself, but she sings about the history of her people. Here they are, under captivity, oppressed, feeling as if they've been rejected, wondering for 400 years silent. Wondering if freedom would come. Wondering if the Messiah would come for four centuries. Nothing. Now Mary knows the promise will come to pass. And God is going to fulfill this promise through her. If you have kids, you have to make a lot of promises, right? Have you ever had your kid look at you and say, but you promised. As a parent, if you're a good parent, I believe that we do everything we can do to keep our promises. Just this morning, I was at the Donuts. And one of, my, one of our kids, Caroline, our youngest, who's six, came to me and asked me a question. She wants to go play with one of her friends, but she put this qualifier on the end of it. Can I go play with my friend someday? When she said someday, I said, sure, someday you can do that. But it's when they get a little bit more specific that it gets a little bit more difficult. You ever been sitting at supper and the kids say, hey, can we play this game tonight? And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. We can play that game before we go to bed. And then you get busy after supper. You're doing the dishes. You're getting baths. You're doing hair. You're taking care of all this kind of stuff. you got to clean the kitchen. I mean, and then all of a sudden, it's bedtime. But you said we could play the game before we went to bed. Go to bed. 
been dealing with y'all all day. No, we're nicer than that. You ever made a promise as a parent? It's a promise you fully intend to keep, but for whatever reason, you're unable to keep that promise. No, it's just me. Okay, I feel bad. Y'all are looking at me like I'm an awful person. I think we've all been there. Promises that we absolutely intend to keep that for whatever reason, circumstances change and you just can't make it happen. That's never happened with God. Never. Not once did God say, oh man, I know I, I promised, but something changed and so now you can't get what I said you could or now you can't do what I said you could do. No, God has never broken a promise. Look at what Mary says in verse 54 and 55 as she recognizes the promise of God. He's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. He had promised all the way back in Genesis 3 a Messiah would come here. He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. He said to Abraham, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Did that happen to Abraham? No. What about Isaac? What about Jacob? What about Joseph? No, no, no. It happens in Jesus this is the promise fulfilled. God keeps his word. God remembers his promises. Not one promise has he made that has failed yet. He always keeps his word. Mary recognizes not just the goodness of God to her, but the goodness of God to, to his people, to Abraham and his offspring forever. There's not a moment that God ever says, I forgot, or I didn't really mean that. He keeps his word. Stories told about a man. Every paycheck he got, he'd get $20 out of his paycheck, and he'd hide the money under his mattress. Every single paycheck, his entire life, he got paid every two weeks. You can imagine his mattress probably got pretty lumpy over the years. That man was on his deathbed and looked at his wife and he said, sweetheart, I need, I need you to make me a promise. You got a promise. She didn't know. He said, every paycheck I've got, every two weeks, all my working life, I've got all kinds of cash hidden under the mattress. I want you to take that and I want you to gather it up and I want you to put it in my casket. Promise me. And she said, I promise. The man passed away, and the wife took all that money. She gathered it together, and she went to the bank and deposited it. And she wrote a check for that entire amount and put it in the casket. <laughs> Did she keep her promise or not? I, I think the reality is in our lives, a lot of times we write checks to God that we never really intend to cash, right? God, I don't know if I meant that. I don't know if I want to go there. I don't know if I want to serve you in this way. Let me, let me tell you this. Let me say it this way. There's never been a promise that God made that he's not willing to sign his name on the bottom line, endorse that check, and you can take it to the bank. Every single one. Here's Mary's song. Probably a 13 or 14 year old unmarried girl who when she hears the news that she'll carry the Messiah rejoices. My soul magnifies the Lord within me. I rejoice in God my Savior. He has done great things for me and for his people and for you. For everyone. Because this Christ, child, came, born of a virgin, lived a perfect, sinless life, died, a cross, died on a cross, a death he did not deserve, buried in a borrowed tomb for three days, but then on the third day, rose again in power and victory, defeating death 
hell, the grave, and all of his enemies. And today, this same Christ, this Messiah, this same Jesus offers hope and redemption to all who will come in humility and brokenness, recognizing their need for a Savior. You can be saved. You can be rescued. You can be redeemed. You can be brought near. You can be forgiven by this Christ. All we see her faith in action. God, I don't understand it. I don't deserve it. But I'm going to obey it. Whatever you call me to do.